This week on Dialogue, The Shadow War. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Our guest this week is Mark Mazzetti. Mark is a national security correspondent for the New York Times and also a public policy scholar here at the Wilson Center. He's working on a book about U.S. counterterrorism since 9-11. Welcome to Dialogue, Mark. Thank you for having me. That's what I want to ask you about. 9-11, the starting point of our story, and uh, things change. The world change in a lot of ways. One way is the way that the United States conducts war, but our perceptions of war may be tied to previous wars. I think of the old adage, which I'm sure you've, you've heard, is the Pentagon fights the last war. We're always stuck. And, and maybe the public envisions the last war. Uh, is the U.S. Uh, public aware of the types of wars that the U.S. is fighting now, what you've called the shadow war? I think to a degree, but um, I, I think people still think of war uh, in the classic sense, as you said, in, in the old wars. And, and we've seen some of that since 9-11 in Iraq. We saw a, a very large ground invasion that was a, you know, going towards a capital. Uh, that's how people envision war. To some degree, it's happened in Afghanistan as well. Uh, but what I'm looking at is uh, the places uh, where the United States has been at war that are not really declared war zones, places, that, uh, uh, places like Pakistan and Yemen, Somalia, where um, you know, the United States is not at war with Pakistan, but they're at war in Pakistan. If we were to do a survey, a random survey of, of U.S. Uh, viewers and listeners of this program, how many of them do you think, what percentage do you think would even associate the United States being at war with Yemen and Pakistan? Well, I mean, if you follow the news, you will see, uh, you know, occasional uh, stories about, you know, drone strikes in Pakistan or mm -hmm. Yemen. And, you know, I write about it so much that uh, it becomes so familiar um, and, and almost routine. Uh, but, but when you step back and think about it, it's still extraordinary that, you know, the Central Intelligence Agency is running a bombing campaign uh, and a missile campaign um, in Pakistan and Yemen. The Pentagon is running a parallel missile campaign in some of these countries. And it's, it really is extraordinary. And, and it's, it's under the radar in the sense that each time there's a drone strike, there's no public discussion of it by our government. Uh, there, uh, this word words leak out, uh, word leaks out, especially if, if a high level leader is killed. Uh, but uh, so much of it is now conducted in secret that it is um, the job of the press, I think, to dig a little deeper to find out what's going on. This sort of reminds me of the way technology progresses so quickly that we don't even have time to think about it before we're adapting new technologies. We barely question them. Are we keeping up with the demands of this new type of warfare? Is the U.S. equipped to fight this so-called shadow war? Well, one of the things I'm looking back on is um, so where things stood in uh, September 11, 2001, how the Pentagon was uh, was was arrayed to fight uh, battles and how the CIA was, uh, what, what the CIA was focused on. I mean, the Pentagon at the time, I remember covering it, um, the, big, the big word was missile defense, uh, that, that it was everyone was going to focus on uh, uh, you know, building a shield uh, to, in case North Korea or Iran were to send a missile our way. And then 9-11 happens, and everyone realized, well, if, if anyone wants to attack the United States, it's not going to be with a ballistic missile. It's going to be with a terrorist type of attack uh, because it's harder to sort of find a, a signature to to to, um, to find, as they say, the return address. So one of one of the most um, extraordinary developments over the last decade, perhaps the most um, significant weapon of the last decade, is the armed drone, uh, because it has allowed the CIA and the Pentagon to to go to war remotely without sending American troops and to do it in a way where you don't acknowledge the operation. Uh, so one of the things I'm going back at is looking at this sort of development of the armed drone inside the military, some of the fights within the CIA uh, about uh, whether to adopt this, because there was real concern in the agency about whether this was a, a weapon they didn't really want. There were implications. The CIA, as we all know, has had its history of, of assassination attempts that, that many at the CIA wanted to forget about, and this new weapon presented some real controversy. And, and I do want to dig deeper into the whole discussion of drones, but first I want to get back to that moment, the catalytic moment you describe, where 9-11 changes the game in a way where there's a different reaction historically from the CIA and from the Pentagon. Who are the, the people who 
uh, identified the need to change and, and who set in motion the Pentagon becoming uh, more of an intelligence agency and the CIA becoming more of a paramilitary or a military agency? Yeah, it's interesting. You've seen over the last decade this sort of convergence uh, where the CIA is acting more like the Pentagon and vice versa. Um, certainly you saw very soon after 9-11 Donald Rumsfeld uh, who uh, was you know, 9-11 happened, and he had been thinking about missile defense. He'd been thinking about China. And uh, here, the Pentagon is pretty ill-equipped to deal with this new threat. He sends this memo that's become sort of famous um, to one of his staffers, and it says, you know, uh, you know, why are we not equipped to be to do manhunting? You know, they did not know how to track uh, people and kill them if, if, if possible. And so he sets a lot of this in motion. Um, and part of it, it was just pure bureaucratic rivalry with the CIA. The CIA goes into Afghanistan. He gets, gets there first. Uh, uh, he was furious that the CIA beat the Pentagon into Afghanistan in the months after 9-11. And so he, he looks to special operations troops as an answer for this, to, to, to send them around the globe. Um, and um, but the problems he, he confronted very early on were, um, you know, can the military operate outside of war zones? We, as you said, think of soldiers going to war in defined war zones uh, where Congress declares war or, or, or we know what they're doing. And this was very different. This was sending soldiers to act more like spies. And the enemy is a nation state, not individuals. That's right. Um, so, so can you send troops into countries um, and without telling that country that they're there? And, and in some cases, not even telling you know, the American ambassador that the troops are there. So in the early years, this, this period of bureaucratic rivalry where everyone was trying to adjust uh, to dealing with this different kind of war. And uh, what about from the CIA side of the equation? Well, right. So the CIA uh, had some, in, as I said, in Afghanistan, they were able to get in there early. They developed the, the tribal contacts from years earlier, dating back to the 80s when they were fighting the Soviets in, in Afghanistan. Uh, but at the same time, the CIA, their paramilitary um, branch was withered. Uh, they didn't have really good um, insight into al-Qaeda. Uh, they had to develop their own capabilities, and once they got the armed drone, uh, they uh, then had questions about, well, how do we use it? And if we don't have any intelligence, we can't ever use it because um, it's only as good as the intelligence network that supports it. And now David Petraeus to the CIA. Leon Panetta to the Pentagon. It seems to institutionalize the types of changes that you're talking about. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, and, and, and you have in the in the months after Osama bin Laden is is killed, um, this flip flop where the four star general goes to run the CIA and the guy running the CIA takes over the Pentagon. And I think both guys uh, got to their new jobs and a lot looked very familiar because they'd been doing much the same thing in their old jobs. Mm -hmm. Now the death of bin Laden, which you referenced, there, there was a time earlier right after the years after 9-11, where that might have uh, appeared to be an end game or, or a, an end moment in this shadow war. Uh, not so. It's come and gone, and the war continues. How significant is the death of Osama bin Laden? I, I think the, the death of bin Laden is, is, is very significant in that he was the... Um, inspirational leader of al-Qaeda, he was the operational leader of al-Qaeda. Uh, and so it, that should not be minimized. But what we've seen over the last 10 years is the threat uh, that he in some ways set in motion uh, has morphed into different ways. So even as Pakistan, um, the, 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 the potential for another terrorist attack on the United States coming out of Pakistan recedes, you see it rising in other places. Yemen is much more uh, in uh, the news these days as the in uncertainty, um, uh, the Arab Spring has brought uh, uncertainty in Yemen. There's a greater control uh, uh, inside Yemen of um, this al-Qaeda affiliate, and the Obama administration is paying a lot of attention to Yemen. Yemen. So by no means did bin Laden's death end it. And in many ways, I think what you're seeing is this new model of war that's been created has been embraced by the Obama administration and will be used. Um, even if o President Obama were to lose the election in November, uh, President Romney, I think, would probably adopt this model, too, because you look at the threats around the globe and the budget constraints the United States is under, um, it's hard to believe we're the United States is going to do another Iraq-style war anytime soon. Are voters of, of Obama, of those who supported Obama, are they disappointed? Did they expect to see a sea change 
when he took over, but essentially uh, what you're describing is he didn't only continue some of the things started under the Bush administration, he's accelerated. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, he started a whole nother front to this war in Yemen. It was going on to some degree uh, under Bush, but, but not to the extent uh, under Obama. He's dramatically accelerated drone strikes in Pakistan. Um, they're looking at places in like North Africa. Um, they're concerned about um, Nigeria. Uh, so uh, Obama really has, I think, em embraced this model. I think some of his supporters are a little uh, disillusioned by it. Certainly you hear the ACLU very concerned about the rapid escalation of drone strikes. Uh, but it's pretty minimal in terms of the, the Democratic, the Democrats in Congress. You don't hear a lot of concern. Now, we're also in an election year and they want their guy reelected, so you're probably unlikely to hear a lot of concern from the left on this, um, which is interesting. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think over time, as we start to learn more and more about it, I think some people are going to start raising more questions about you know, this new model and its implications. What are those negative implications that you expect people to begin to question? Well, I think that there's a big question about the more you conduct war in secret, uh, the less accountable it is and the fewer people who are making decisions, um, there's a greater poss possibility for error. I mean, these drone strikes, I, I, I do believe that um, care is, great care is taken to minimize civilian casualties in Pakistan and Yemen, but uh, is uh, I'm sure they're not zero, and and we, it's very hard to know exactly the extent of the casualties because their carried drone strikes are carried out in places that are not um, easily accessible for journalists or international rights organizations, and when you don't have a government spokesman standing up at a podium and saying this happened yesterday or the day before, um, then there's this lack of accountability that I think then. Um, you know, I, 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 I think that there may raise some problems in the future. We may look back at a period of time when there was far more extensive warfare going on than the American public knew about. And, and sometimes as we look at American history, when that happens, we come to regret it. Uh, critics of the drone strikes have also said that they, they think more harm than good is being done as far as the war of ideas that uh, the drone strikes and the negative feelings about them, particularly when they go wrong and strike civilians, are creating more terrorists or, or, or encouraging more people with anti-U.S. sentiments. It, it's one of those things that I think at this point is still hard to know. I think there are um, certainly the concerns. I mean, um, the, a, a very big moment last fall was when the United States made the decision to kill Anwar al who was an American citizen, um, but a radical cleric in Yemen who was one of the leaders of the al-Qaeda affiliate in Yemen. Uh, it was a, it was the U.S. had been hunting him for quite some time. The CIA came in and killed him with a drone strike. Um, since that time, Al Qaeda in Yemen has only grown stronger, and that is not to say that uh, Al Aki's death um, incited more people to join the group. But certainly, it does not mean that just killing people with drones uh, by itself will reduce the, the the terror threat. On this accountability question, the the, the classic checks and balance model seems to be lost in this frenzy of, of new arrangements, whether it's the drone strikes or all the contractors being used. Uh, nobody can really track it or, or there aren't congressional hearings to uh, cover private industry. Right. I mean, one a another aspect of the shadow war is that um, that you rely increasingly on contractors because you can send them in countries where you couldn't send American troops. Um, the Pentagon has hired uh, contractors to spy because they didn't like what the CIA was doing. Uh, they um, it's been there's been some cases where uh, it's been a little bit of an ugly picture. The the. Um, and, and when that means in terms of accountability is, um, you know, s different members, different committees in Congress have oversight over different uh, parts of the government. So for the CIA, the oversight is from the intelligence committees. The, um, the Pentagon has over, the Armed Services Committee have oversight over, over the Pentagon. Um, and yet when they're with so much blurring of the lines, um, in some cases, neither committee um, can really dig into the situation because they don't have jurisdiction. So I talk to con members of Congress and people in these committees and they say, well, we'd like to know what's going on, but the Pentagon doesn't tell us because we don't have jurisdiction over them. Is, this, is the contracting, you know, one way to look at it is that this is uh, filling a void as far as resources and manpower. Uh, or, or it's a way to be more cost effective. Mm -hmm. But is it also a way to avoid the accountability? Well, in the, other words, what's the motivation to, for Yeah, for I, mean, sometimes, I mean, I mean, you know, contractors get a 
get a sort of put in a bad light just and, and and I think sometimes unfairly and the government relies on them because as you said the government uh, they these these people are filling a need and um, the contractors there I mean sometimes they charge a lot more and so from a cost pers perspective it's it's not a good arrangement for the US government but I think problematically it's um, contractors are supposed to um, fill jobs that are not in what's called law traditional government activities mm -hmm. um, and yet you find contractors spying, you find contractors pulling triggers on drones, so in, in effect contractors are killing people. Um, and um, when you look at the functions of what a government should do, generally that's a pretty basic function is, is intelligence gathering, going to war. I mean, American troops and American spies should be doing that. If it's outsourced to contractors, I think there are greater issues of who's watching the contractors. You just, uh, you just said that contractors get a bad name, or, or maybe it were a little gratuitous in our, mm -hmm. in our criticism of them. Uh, what's the case for contractors? Are, are they a net positive in this game? Well, I, I, and game I, is a bad word. Yeah, and no, I, apologize I, I mean for I, it. I think that um, y y the United States couldn't have done anything it wanted to do in the last ten years unless it had contractors. Mm -hmm. I mean, the contractors do very basic functions like like uh, cook food for troops in Afghanistan. Uh, they uh, provide logistic services. It's not all shadowy. It's not all shadowy, and um, and so. Um, but there's all there's other companies. I mean, if you look around Washington um, or you know places like Northern Virginia, um, there's a lot of big buildings going up in places like Tyson's Corner, Virginia, um, and it's it's an, an entirely some of these companies no one knows any much about that are getting classified American government contracts, whether it's from the Pentagon or from the CIA, other intelligence agencies, and we and I don't know a lot about what they do um, but clearly um, the government is relying on them and um, and, I, and I don't think that uh, the overseers the people who are supposed to have a handle on how much these people are getting paid and what they're doing I don't think they have a, a, a real good grasp on what's going on either and, and there's the problem in that you know from cr uh, critical analysis from the outside looking in and that uh, maybe it's good for warfare but what you're describing sounds bad for democracy the people involved, citizens, taxpayers, can't well, keep track. Well, I mean, I think I think that um, there is um, there is the potential for um, th th this sort of super state being created um, outside of the public that um, is a sort of machine to go to war, and it's sort of an intelligence machine and a military machine that um, is even more than normal um, out of the public eye, and even. Um, Beyond congressional scrutiny, and I and I I give um, I mean I you have place, sympathy for that argument. Well, and I, yeah, and I, I but I actually place a lot of blame on, on members of Congress too. I think that there's not nearly the attend you know the members of Congress don't spend nearly enough time um, trying to examine this. I think you find that the intelligence committees um, you know do work, but they are understaffed. They can only do so much. Um, it's it's partly their fault as well. Hmm. Are we are are we essentially lowering the bar for what it means to go to war? I think there's the potential for that. Um, I think that um, you know, if you look, if you look at um, a, a revolutionary weapon like an armed drone, where you can carry out a strike uh, in a country like Somalia, and and when you're doing armed strikes and killing people, I I would call that war or a form of war. Um, then and and do it in a way that uh, that you're not acknowledging, and um, you know maybe people don't find out about for for years and years to come. Uh, then. Um, I think it is easy. It is easier to go to war. Um, there is something about the, you know, the big wars, the, the the decision to go into Iraq. Now, there's a lot of faults about the decision to go in Iraq, and those have been well discussed. But it was, at the very least, it was a very public. Um, sort of wrangling and, and sort of this effort to, to sort of get other allies on board. I mean, the United States knew we were, American people knew we were about to go to war in Iraq. Um, these other countries uh, where the U.S. has been operational, um, I mean, there's some, some countries that, that uh, I don't have a whole lot of uh, insight into, into how we're conducting these wars, and certainly I don't think the American people do. Now, this national security is certainly not a new beat to you, and so you're a ex very experienced reporter with lots of context. Contacts, but as you've dug into the book and focused on it in a new way, what have you uncovered that has surprised you? Um, I think that um, what has been, as some documents um, get get uh, declassified, and um, you know, you end up you end up learning more. I think that there's um, a far greater amount of 
private spying going on. Uh, and when I, when I say that is the government hiring private country companies to do actually intelligence gathering, um, which uh, I thought was far more limited before I started digging into this. Um, I think that the, some of the documents that have been declassified about the early years after 9-11 from the Pentagon, to the extent that you know, Rumsfeld and his aides really were trying to accelerate um, intelligence gathering by the Pentagon, and going into countries far afield, um, places in Europe, places um, in North Africa that um, you know I didn't know about, and um, some of those early battles with um, the, uh, the between the CIA and the Pentagon, I've I've, I've found pretty interesting. Um, so it's a pretty broad subject, and I find that I um, I, I, I you know, will spend days or weeks just. You know, as I learn something new, I'll go off in different directions I never expected to go off. And, and how difficult has it been to uh, find people willing to talk? It's hard. The, um, uh, as I said, there, there, there has been um, a fair amount of, of information that's been declassified, but still, uh, given the nature of, of, of the subject I'm, I'm looking into, um, and there have been um, some high-profile cases of people going to jail for talking to reporters, um, there are sometimes not a whole lot of people who who want to sort of sit down and talk about everything they've been doing for the last 10 years. So that can sometimes be a challenge. <laughs> and who are some of the key players that have emerged in your story? People that aren't on the tips of tongues of people around the country, not the household names, but are, are key figures within the story. Yeah, there's people that, I mean, some of the people we've discussed are well known, like uh, Leon Panetta, Donald Rumsfeld, David Petraeus. Uh, but there are people who are, you know, one or two levels below who, uh, who are, who are, in, in a way, so much more central to this. Um, you look at um, William McRaven, who was the head of the Pentagon's Joint Special Operations Command, and you know, viewers will remember that Mc it was McRaven who was very central to the bin Laden uh, operation that uh, killed Osama bin Laden. Uh, McRaven um, did, a, did a lot to expand Joint Spe Special Operations Command to go beyond traditional war zones. I mean, when you think about it, um, the bin Laden raid was American military forces in operating inside a country that's an American ally, Pakistan, mm -hmm. not telling the Pakistanis that we were going to do it because they were worried the Pakistanis might tip bin Laden. And, um, and they were fully prepared to go to battle with Pakistani troops if something went wrong. I mean, that's an extraordinary um, event uh, when you think about it, and it was McRaven who was in charge of that operation, and certainly if something had gone horribly wrong, it might have been McRaven um, who was on the hook. Uh, McRaven could have gotten fired for it. Um, but, but he is an interesting character just because he has studied special operations um, all his career. He's a Navy SEAL, uh, and um, we see the SEALs so much in the news these days because they're relied on for these types of operations. The, this is maybe a tough question, but do you get a sense that this is evolving in a way that is orderly and planned, this new approach to warfare? Or is it more organic and reactionary? Uh, you know what I'm getting at is, is, should we have confidence that we're getting it right most of the time? Or are we just stumbling along as right. events uh, occur? I think that there's been a much greater collaboration between uh, the intelligence world and the military world um, over the last 10 years, um, and in the last couple of years than there were immediately after 9-11. I think there was a lot of fumbling around in the first years. There was a lot of rivalries and competitions. Some of that was personality driven. As I said, going back to sort of Rumsfeld and George Tenet, um, George Tenet, the CIA director, who had a somewhat contentious relationship. And so they were, they were sort of guarding their own turf. I think that um, over time, there's been more collaboration and, and more um, cooperation between the CIA and the Pentagon. So it's working better, um, but at the same time, uh, I, I think that you that these cases arise, and um, just because it's become e easier to do to do these types of operations does not necessarily mean it's always the best type of thing to do. So I think that there there is a risk of you know being seduced by secrecy, seduced by secret operations. You become so good at it, you want to do it all the time. And again, you, there may be some repercussions down the road that we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. The uh, the the partisan politics that. Uh, dominate uh, the Washington scene these days. Uh, one of the great hopes in the area of national security is that there's a certain bipartisanship that will put the safety of the nation ahead of politics. What is your sense about how partisan politics has had an impact on the shadow war? 
Well, it's or has it? Well, it's um, certainly you've seen you saw plenty of partisanship in the um, you know mid part of the last decade after the Iraq War and with all of the fallout about um, you know inter CIA interrogation, secret prisons. Um, but interestingly, what you're seeing right now is this is this political environment where. Uh, there is a lot of um, bipartisan support for um, operating in the shadows. And that's in part, I think, because, um, we, again, going back to you know, we're in election season, the Republicans are not about to start criticizing President Obama for being too aggressive on al Qaeda. Uh, it would be hypocritical and, and they wouldn't believe it. I mean, they, they always pushed him um, uh, and pushed President Bush to be very aggressive. Um, at the same time, there's not a whole lot of, as we said earlier, um, criticism from Democrats because some, even though they might feel a little bit queasy about it, don't want to uh, challenge President Obama. So there is, and so consequently, I don't think that this year, um, leading up to the no November election, you're going to see a lot of debate on these issues. Uh, final quick thought, we only have about, about a minute left, and it's about time. Uh, in an iconic war of the past or a mythical war image of the past, you know, war ends, there's a parade, there are statues built, there are heroes. How long does this war go on? We don't even, we can't even identify a single enemy. Is this an endless war? It's hard to say. I think that uh, people who study uh, terrorist organizations uh, and counterterrorism say that you know, when you look at history, whether it's in Malaysia or you know, or the the Irish Irish experience in in, in uh, sorry, the British British and Northern Ireland. I mean, things tend to peter out after a, a, a few decades. It's hard to know whether we're in the middle of something that has another 10, 20 years. Whether this is an endpoint, as we said earlier, you know, the Bin Laden um, raid and and the killing of Osama bin Laden felt like this endpoint, but. Um, I think a year later, we see this going on for, for years to come. Well, Mark, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for allowing me to read your book proposal in preparation for our interview. It makes me look very much forward to the book. It's very well written. You're a great storyteller, and I look forward thanks to it. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll return next week for another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molusky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.